My name is Rory Haddon. I work in the BRE Centre for Fire Safety Engineering, uh, which is down in King's Building. And uh, I'm the, the Rush Group Lecturer in Fire Investigation. And I think I've probably got one of the best jobs in the world because uh, I get paid to burn things. And, and that's quite an interesting uh, uh, thing to be able to look at. You can see here, this is a picture of me uh, looking very uh, academic in our, in our lab. Um, looking at uh, a box uh, in which there is some fire. And, and what we kind of spend our time doing is, is really trying to understand how fires burn. Um, how does that happen if there's a fire in a room? What are the processes that are going on? What is the chemistry? What is the heat transfer? Uh, trying to understand how the smoke moves and all this kind of stuff. Um, and that's what I do for most of my life. Uh, most of my day job involves, involves that. Um, but I'm not here to talk just about that today. Uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about something uh, different. Uh, we're going to talk about toilets. Uh, it's not the most glamorous of subjects, but hopefully uh, in the next 10, 15 minutes you'll, you'll begin to get an appreciation of why such a mundane object is so interesting for someone who enjoys burning stuff. So toilets have been a subject uh, of many things. This is Marcel Duchamp. This is some toilets as art. Uh, who, who knew you could have such a mundane object making such a powerful statement? And, and I'm, I'm no art historian, but I think the statement here is something like, you know, here's an everyday object. If an artist signs it, does that make it art? Uh, you know, so the toilet is being used to make some, some pretty serious points. Architects also enjoy toilets. This is a, a paper that was written about the, um, the role of the toilet in the design of the Sydney Opera House. So an incredibly iconic building with some incredibly uh, not successful toilets. Uh, the article is quite interesting. It uh, goes through the history of whether you should use an off-the-shelf toilet or have a custom-made toilet and what that might mean for your building. But it's, it's, uh, it's architecture, that's all I can say. Um, but these two things are all based on the toilet that was invented by this chap. This is Thomas Crapper. Um, the etymology of the word is not what you think it is. Um, so this guy is a Victorian gentleman and he didn't invent the toilet as we know it, but he certainly popularized the flushing toilet. So, any toilet that you've probably ever used uh, originates from this guy. He invented several of the bits of plumbing that go around it uh, and popularized some other ideas. Um, and his toilet is, is very good. Um, if you think about what the toilet does, it's a very effective way at collecting waste. Um, it's a very effective way at conveying that waste to somewhere else where you don't have to deal with it. It's uh, got an incredibly simple, incredibly well-engineered user interface. Uh, it's kind of intuitive. You don't really have to think about how to use a toilet. Everyone kind of just knows. Okay? Um, you could almost argue that it is the pinnacle of engineering design. There is no better system. Perhaps there is, though, because one billion people across the world practice open defecation. That's exactly what it sounds like. That's having nowhere to go to the toilet other than in the open. Um, and in developing nations, about 50% of the urban populations have got no access to sanitation. So no running water, um, no clean toilets, no safe toilets, no toilets where women can't go uh, for fear of being attacked by men, that sort of thing. So why don't we just build toilets? I mean, it's an easy thing to do, isn't it? It's a simple process to make a toilet. Um, Thomas Crapper has shown us that since the Victorian times. But toilets are not simple, and toilets are not cheap, and toilets are not easy. Every time you flush a toilet, six liters of water straight down the drain. Six liters of clean, fresh drinking water straight down the drain. Not just straight down the drain, but straight down the drain polluted again. So you have to treat that water. And we treat that water is incredibly energy intensive, uh, incredibly costly. About 5% uh, of the UK's carbon emissions come from treating wastewater streams. So Thomas Crapper's invention, not so good, perhaps. Perhaps it's not so good. This is toilet 1.0, I think. Um, it did a very good job in countries that were rich uh, at eradicating disease, at improving human health. Okay? But what does toilet 2.0 look like? What does that need to do? That, the system we have now is clearly not scalable. It's clearly not going to work. Well, toilet 2.0 has to offer exactly the same benefits and even maybe some improvements. So toilet 2.0 has to maintain the rapid disinfection. It has to get the waste away from the user as fast as possible. If it's going to be deployed in developing nations, it needs to be off-grid. It can't rely on a huge sewer system uh, that's cost billions to install and uh, thousands of dollars to operate. It has to be low cost. The running cost can't be high. Six liters of water 
Uh, if, you, if you live in an arid region, you can't afford to pour that down the drain. It has to be user orientated. Different parts of the world use toilets in different ways. Um, different people have different kind of uh, contextual uh, uh, awareness of the toilet. It has to be robust. Uh, it's not something that can break. If anyone's ever lived in a flat where the toilet's broken, that's pretty uh, uncomfortable, so it has to be very robust. And it has to be aspirational. Um, you, it's very difficult to sell someone a solution that is less good than what they have or what they can see at present. So this is Toilet 2.0. But Toilet 2.0 is not my idea. Toilet 2.0 is the idea of this guy. This is Bill Gates. Um, Bill Gates, incredibly rich, gave all his money to a foundation, and the foundation sponsored a challenge uh, to reinvent the toilet. <coughs> and that's where we come in. Um, I was uh, part of a team um, that was involved in developing a toilet. Um, and basically, we'd got to the point, or the team had got to the point, where they were actually able to do quite a lot of this. Sorting the pee from the poo was easy. Uh, treating the pee was kind of uh, a little bit straightforward. But the question is, what do you do with the solid waste? How do you dispose of that quickly, cheaply, and make it sterile. So this is what pee and poo is. I mean, they're, they're, nothing, very, they're nothing very complicated. I mean, pee is basically water uh, with a few other bits and bobs thrown in. Um, we can't do very much with that, but it's typically sterile at the, 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 the source, let's say. Um, poo, on the other hand, not sterile at, that, sterile at the source. Um, on average, each person, each user, uh, deposits 128 grams per day. It's about 75% water. And it's about 20% organic, so bacteria, blood cells, proteins, all sorts of, of stuff. Um, now, how are we going to treat that? The best way to destroy something um, is to burn it. Incineration is incredibly good at destroying many pathogens that you find in poo. Uh, it's incredibly good at reducing um, the, the quantity that you have as well. It reduces it down to ash. Um, but incineration is hard. Burning things is really hard, uh, it turns out. Um, and it's particularly burning wet things. Okay? Burning wet things is hard for two reasons. Uh, I'm sure if you've ever tried to burn wet wood, you might have experienced some of this. But one of the reasons is uh, you the, the time scale of the flame is very fast. So the chemical reaction that happens in the flame that releases all of the energy and all of the heat from the flame, that happens on the order of milliseconds. But the time it takes for that heat to get transferred into the poo, to heat up the poo, to evaporate the water from the poo, that takes certainly seconds, perhaps minutes. So there's this time scale incompatibility. The other problem is the water. It's 75% water. Now, things that are three quarters water tend to not burn very well. So there's a problem there uh, in terms of the quantity. And if you look at it, evaporating one gram of water takes about half a calorie. Calories is in the kind you eat. Um, if you want to, uh, to evaporate the 100 grams of water that's in a typical poo, that's going to take uh, about 55 calories, which is about a quarter of a chocolate bar. Okay? This is my, my chocolate bar poo analogy gets, gets, gets stretched here. So a quarter of a chocolate bar, but the best combustion systems in the world, the kinds of power stations that we heard about in the previous talk, the thermal power stations, achieve an efficiency of about 40%. Okay? So if you took that poo and tried to put it in one of those power stations, you would need about one chocolate bar's worth of energy to evaporate all that water. The problem is we can't build toilets and feed the power station. This has to be off-grid. This has to be something that's much simpler. So let's try building a little bonfire and treating the poo that way. Now the problem with that is the efficiency there of the combustion is only like 5%. So only 5% of all the energy that you burn would end up back in the poo. Uh, so that means we now need uh, about 500 grams of chocolate. We need half a kilo. And luckily, chocolate and wood have about the same heat of combustion, so the energy in chocolate and wood is about the same. So to burn one poo, you need to go out, find half a kilo of wood, bring it back, and burn your poo. Okay? That's not going to work. Okay? It's not going to work here, I don't think. Um, there's not much wood around to start with, um, and there's not much. Uh, and, and the wood that is there has to be used for cooking and other much more important things. It's not going to work here either. Uh, this is, is Bangladesh. This is after some flooding. So where do you get the wood from? How do you get dry wood to burn the poo? So there's a problem. But is there something that we can, that we can do? Is there something that, as a fire scientist, as a, somebody who knows a little bit about combustion, knows a little bit about how things burn, is there something we can do? And obviously, otherwise I wouldn't be here, the answer is yes. Uh, in the natural world, we see things like this. This is peat. Peat burns 
uh, all the time and in vast quantities around the world. Peat can also be very wet. Uh, it can absorb almost eight times its own weight in water, it's a big sponge. It can't burn when it's that wet, but if it dries out over the summer or in a drought period and it gets down to about 125% moisture, so it's more than its own weight in water, it will burn. It will smolder, as you see here. Um, so the smoldering reaction uh, is something that's actually important here. Smoldering you're all familiar with, even if you don't know, uh, if you don't know it. If you've ever had a barbecue, um, you're familiar with smoldering, that kind of glowing combustion where there are no flames. Um, or if you ever smoke a cigarette, uh, that's also uh, a smoldering combustion. The cigarette is not there to promote smoking. The cigarette is there so you can understand a little bit later on what we're doing. So think how a cigarette works. You suck on this end, you draw air through the cigarette, and the smoldering propagates towards the tip. Okay? And that's how a smoldering cigarette works. So the next question, can poo smolder? Okay, well, why would you want to use the smoldering to get poo to work? Well, the smoldering is very good because you mix the fuel uh, into a porous kind of uh, media. The porous media lets the air flow through it, um, and the porous media is also very good at retaining heat. So it's very effective at controlling the energy that's released from the smoldering and trapping that. Trapping that energy means you can uh, more effectively evaporate the water, you can more effectively treat the poo. Now, Unfortunately, as scientists, there's only one way to find out if it works. There's literally only one way to find out. And that means burning poo, okay? Uh, now, if you've ever gone through the University Health and Safety Regulations, they don't let you burn poo. It's pretty much explicit. Um, so there was a problem. But it wasn't too big of a problem because these guys have solved that problem. Turns out poo is a problem also on the space station. Uh, and the scientists who were developing the toilets there had exactly the same thought process. They didn't want to deal with poo. So they made a recipe for surrogate poo. Uh, and surrogate poo has the same kind of rheological property. Uh, it has the same um, consistency. It has the same heat of combustion. Uh, it even has uh, very similar visual uh, properties. And the recipe is basically this. There's some polyethylene glycol. That makes it thick. It gives it some consistency. Um, you can use some yeast to represent the, um, the, well, the bacterial uh, debris that's there. But mostly, uh, the, the synthetic poo is miso paste, cotton, and husk. So it's fiber, um, cellulose, and proteins. Now, actually, this smells quite good. It makes the lab smell of peanut butter. It makes it smell like we're all having a good time. It doesn't look so good, though. This is what the synthetic poo looks like. Um, and there's a problem with this. Remember I said earlier that the smoldering has to be, uh, for smoldering to work, the, the, the fuel has to be porous. This doesn't look porous. This is gloop, is basically what that is. So we have to do some work on this. Um, we can't get something for nothing, so the, the kind of technological innovation is the most high-tech thing you, cannot, you could almost ever think of. It's adding sand. Okay? So you take the poo, you mix it with some sand, um, and you get this picture on the right. You get this kind of weird, gritty, pooey mess. Okay? Then, we have to try the experiment. So we try the experiment. This is the, the experimental apparatus. It's very, very simple. Um, and it looks a little bit like a cigarette. If we rotate this uh, on its side, we've basically got a cigarette, where there's ignition at the bottom, and air flows from the bottom to the top, just as it flows from the end of the cigarette into the mouth of the person smoking. Okay? Um, we can change all sorts of things here in the lab. We can, we can investigate all sorts of, of fun things do a lot of experiments, these are all experimental conditions, get a whole bunch of data that looks at how, how well the system operates over a range of conditions, how much sand we put, how much poo there is, how wet the poo is, all that kind of stuff. And that's fine, there's no time to digest all that today, so we'll show you the video. This is the poo smoldering. You can see the purple band is the, the heat being released, the energy being released from the poo, and you can see that the orange poo gets converted to black. Um, the black stuff is, is char, um, and that's basically just carbon. It's more or less completely uh, inert. It's a pretty slow process. That takes about 60 minutes. Uh, sorry, it takes about 20 minutes. It's sped up about 60 times. But it burns. And it burns this well. On the left is a sample of poo and sand, and on the right is the sample after the, the smoldering process. You can see the sand and little flecks of black carbon. But this mixture is totally sterile. Uh, it's been heated to, heated to temperatures of around 600 degrees, for a number of minutes, uh, which exceeds the criteria that's used in a hospital to sterilize uh, surgery equipment. Um, and because of the sand um, 
matrix, that heat is retained for a long time, very, very long time. So can Pu smolder? Yes, excellent. So we've kind of helped with this little problem a little bit. Um, we've helped find a way to treat the processed Pu. That was very nice. So we, we took our design to, uh, to a competition in Seattle that was being run by, by the Gates Foundation. Uh, you can see the Pu reactor on the right, um, the kind of black band being where all the, the Pu is burned. The rest of it is um, drying in the middle and, and the P treatment on the left-hand side. This was a very early stage prototype. Um, Bill Gates was there. He, he enjoyed uh, touching it and interacting with the, the smoldering. Um, and here he is having that explained to him. Um, the toilet was then quite successful. Unfortunately, I, was, I then had to no longer be involved. The toilet was incredibly successful uh, and went off to get another round of funding. And there's a prototype that is built. And they've ex expanded the range of conditions. So I now mean, I don't even need to dry the poo before they smolder it. Uh, they've been able to, to improve the, the efficiency so much. This is the team. These are the people we came and we were runners up. Uh, I should say that these guys did most of the hard work, uh, and that is who I would like to acknowledge at the end of this talk. So um, thank you very much, and I hope that's given you some insight uh, into how shit burns. Thank you. This production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh.